yesterday and today and forever. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we are grateful for this wonderful truth, these wonderful truths that are going to transpire as a result of studying this phrase. Lord, we praise you that you are unending, unchanging. So when they sing these songs about bearing this weight of the world of the life, They'll know who they can turn to because you never change. I pray that you would use this message, your word, to strengthen our hearts. And Lord, that you would use us this evening to change hearts. And I pray it all in your son's name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right. Do you have a favorite Christmas song or carol. All right. I cannot say that I have a favorite. I like them all. I like many of them. I, don't, I do not like them all, per se, in some regards. I do like the song Jenny's going to sing tonight. Mary, do, did, you, did you know? Or, and uh, because it's very thought-provoking. What I do not really care about Christmas, and some of you may disagree with me on this, I do not like Christmas songs beginning uh, around Thanksgiving and playing for 30 consecutive days, 24-7, nonstop, because by the time it gets to Christmas, I am mentally fatigued from hearing those songs 14 different ways on uh, any given day. So you may love to hear them. That's great. I'm just telling you. Sometimes they, uh, if it's just consistently saying that, um, it can it can become redundant a little bit, and then the then the words do you do miss out. But we were driving home last week, and oh, we uh, came across this billboard, and it said, "Do you see what I see?" So I went, and because you can Google, I was not driving, but you can Google lyrics from any song that you want. And uh, so I Googled the song, Do You See What I See? And uh, I noticed that there was a progression. It starts out, this night wind speaks to a little lamb, all right? And it says, do you see the light up in the sky? Do you see what I see? This star dancing. And then the little lamb tells somebody, ends up, there's a king. And the king says, <clears throat> listen, pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. The child, the child, capital C, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. There's this progression. There's this progression of this, uh, obviously, they're personifying the wind and the lamb. But there's this progression from just seeing this light to seeing a baby. That's what the, the shepherd boy tells the king. There's a baby. He's freezing. And the king says, no, it's more than a baby freezing. There's a baby in that crib. We need to pray because he can bring goodness and light. There's this progression. It keeps getting deeper, drawing us into a deeper meaning of what Christmas is all about. And that's what, you know, that tends to happen with us. I don't know what your first thoughts are when the Christmas season starts. And by the way, the Christmas season starts about the 4th of July in America anymore. So they kind of really burn that out. But I don't know what your first thoughts are. Your first thoughts, oh, what am I, what am I going to get so-and-so this year? Another year and I have to get so-and-so. Or maybe it's, oh, got to get the house clean and we got to make this. And you just start going through this mental Rolodex of all the stuff that you have to be prepared for. Mostly the ladies, rarely the men, uh, but could be the men. And I'm not saying they can't. And Or maybe you have pleasant thoughts. Maybe Christmas when you were growing up was just this special day that maybe family came over. My grandpa and grandma, my great grandma always came over. And my great grandma always made oatmeal and banana bread. And after we opened our presents, we always went into the kitchen and had my, my memories of Christmas are pleasant. That may not be, so that may be the first thought, all right? I don't know, but I know every one of us has an initial thought, and almost everyone's initial thought is really not where God would want us to be in regards to thinking about Christmas, all right? Usually, it takes time, and we have to think about what's really going on 
to really understand what we're commemorating. All right. Certainly all of the selling and, and stuff that goes on, commercializing of Christmas takes away the meaning. But God wants us to draw us into a deeper understanding. And that's really the goal for tonight. To have the people with the songs and the Bible verses that we're going to read to allow God to take them to a deeper understanding of who Jesus Christ is. So this morning, and for the Christmas season, really, I don't know what, uh, there we go. We're going to take a look at, we're going to take a look at Jesus Christ, and we're going to, from the point of view of God, when God saw his son, Jesus, lying in that manger, and he were to ask us that same question the song asked, do you see what I see? When you see Jesus Christ lying in that manger, what do you see? And the question I'm asking myself, do I see the same thing God sees? All right. So this morning we're going to talk about never changing the perfect conditions, dependable teachings, and never changing truth. All right. The stability. When you look in the manger and you see that boy child, do you see the stability that Jesus Christ brings this world and the believer? Because most of us would agree. I don't, do not think we would have to have much discussion. It feels as if this world is spinning out of control. And that would imply God doesn't have control. And that can't be true. So in the believer, when you see Jesus, when, when the manger representation, do you see stability? Do you see what I see? And so we're going to take a look at that this morning. We're going to start out with this never changing. And we're getting this. So you can turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. You're there. Verse number 8. We're going to look at a couple other. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Now that's a glorious truth. And that deserves its attention. But that's not the first place in this book where this is mentioned or where it comes from. So go back. We want to follow this thread about Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And that thread starts, or at least in, as far as this epistle is concerned, it starts over in chapter 1 and verse number 10. It starts in chapter 1, verse number 10. And it says here, Thou and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth. So it's talking about the context is creation. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. Now here's the truth. Jesus, he's forever. But now I'm introduced to the rest of creation or creation itself. And I find out this truth. It shall perish. Verse number 11. But thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And that's how you feel as you age, right? You feel like you're waxing old like a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be, they shall be changed. But contrary to that, thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So we have this Christ never changing, but then we see the rest of creation, and it's in a different state that the Bible talks about. It's not consistent. It's changing. But that's not where that verse comes from. That verse is a quotation from Psalm 102. So let's go back there and take a look at it where it originates. Psalm 102, verse 25. As I get there myself. Of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth. Again, talking about creation. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shall endure. Thou shall stand. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture thou shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. 
but God, but thou, Lord, but thou, Jesus, you are the same, and thy years shall have no end. So there's a couple things that I learned from this, that I recognize from this, all right? There is nothing in creation that is self-sustaining, it is all dependent upon something else to sustain it. It is all headed in one direction. And for you scientific-minded people, that would be the second law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy. Things are not getting better or newer. Things are getting older and disorganized. Everything is declining and is headed towards disorganization. All right? That is a law. That's where it's headed. All right? This makes everything that is created dependent. I am not self-sustaining. All right? If I try to be self-sustaining, I will die. So what would be the greatest characteristic of the individual who is sustaining me in order to keep me alive, what would be the greatest attribute where I'm deriving my sustenance from, my dependency from, what would be the greatest attribute this person could have or this individual, all right? If this absolute individual, <clears throat> if this person were not destructive, if this person was dependability, reliability, consistency, I don't have that in myself, but if they, I can find this person who's dependable, reliable, and consistent, that is the individual that I need the most, correct? And that's what God is. He is my sustainer. And because I cannot sustain myself, my state of flux is headed towards destruction, disorder, and decline. Who can stop the madness? And the answer is who? Jesus Christ, who will never change, and that is him. I am absolutely, excuse me, this is. Why doesn't God have to change? Well, it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises and next to praises. If you have your Bible open to that or you're a note taker, you want to write the word excellencies or excellent. I'm to show forth the praises of the excellencies of the excellence of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. If folks, if something is excellent, does it need to change? No. God doesn't need to change. He is excellent. All right. John 8, 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Why does God not have to change? Number one, he's excellent. Number two, Jesus asked the question, which one of you can convict me, can accuse me and make it stick that I have sinned? Now, one of us in this room would dare ask that question. Not a one of us. We'd only have to get your mother, your wife, or your, chil your children, and they would definitely spill the beans, wouldn't they? that you are not perfect. So God does not need to change because he is excellent. There is no room for improvement in him. He is dependable. He does not have to change. I am not self-reliant. I need to rely on someone else. I need to rely on this individual who is absolutely perfect. Now, what is the application for this in my life? And this comes from the book we're reading, Jim Berg. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 2. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse number 2.
Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and what? Virtue, and that's the same word, excellencies, that was quoted in 1 Peter. And what I want to note from this verse is, in verse number three, God hath given unto us how many things that pertain unto life and godliness? All things. So let's combine these two truths. God has provided all things needed for us to live out these excellencies. Number two, God never changes. So I can conclude then, due to God's unchanging nature, the conditions are always right for Christ to come bursting through in my life. Did you get that? The conditions are always there. There are always perfect conditions for the excellencies of Jesus to come shining through in my life because God has given me how many things? All things, and he never, he never changes. I can never, see, I, we're down at Connections, and kids are being kids, kindergartners are being kindergartners, and fourth graders are being fourth graders. And you go to them and you tell them, please stop doing that. That is a wrong behavior that you are doing. And instead of the young person acknowledging, yes, that is a wrong behavior on my part, the almost without exception, the first words out of their mouths are why that person has caused my misbehavior. As if I have absolutely no other recourse than to cuff them upside the head, call them a bad name, throw my paper across the floor, chuck an apple, do whatever, scoot on the floor. It, it, I can, it can't possibly be that I should respond correctly. That's not possible. See, it's not my fault. It's this, that, and the other thing are what's going on. You really should be talking to him. The, down there, if you would observe, the conditions are never right for good behavior. And sometimes that's the attitude we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ get. I can't help myself. Yes, you can. You can help yourself. The conditions are absolutely perfect for you to help yourself, keep yourself from doing that. I am in a state of decline, disorganization, going the wrong direction on my own. Everything that is created is in the same condition. I want to know, can somebody stop that? And if they can stop it, can they consistently stop it? Or is it just a band-aid and tomorrow I'm going to be faced with the same issues, with the same hopelessness, with the same fears, with the same whatever else you want to throw in there. Is there any hope for me tomorrow because I'm on this state of decline? I cannot sustain myself. And the answer is yes, there is hope for you. There is someone, though you are waxing old like a garment and you do t at times feel like you're being folded up, ready to be shoved into to the dresser drawer to be done with. Though you feel that way, there is somebody there reliably, consistently, dependably there that is there to sustain you and always is going to create the right condition for you to flourish in Christ's excellencies. Right? It is always there. I'm not hopeless. I'm not in a, a state of despair because I'm not sitting here like many of the young people in this world today wondering, what is this all about? Where is this going? Why am I here? And they have no uh, a projection of the future because they don't care about it. It doesn't look like anything they want to be a part of. 
Do you remember when you couldn't wait to be an adult? And now you wish, wish I wouldn't have thought that. Do you know rarely, is it rare to find a young person who's excited about becoming an adult? It's like they want to stay where they're what? Where they're at. Why not? Don't you, can't you wait to see what your life is going to be? Can't you wait to see what's possible with you? The God who sustains you never changes. He is not going to fold you up. He's going to keep creating you. He's going to keep providing that perfect environment where you can flourish so that the excellencies, because you and I, we haven't reached excellencies yet, but we're on the right trail and we're headed in that direction and we have to maintain the same focus and the same desire to keep after it. Don't confuse your body falling apart from your soul and spirit flourishing. They're not the same. They're not connected. You are going to go back to dust. God promised you that unless the rapture occur. You're headed in that direction. Don't get frustrated with it. Anticipate it and say, praise God, that's not what's going to control my life. I'm not going to be like a worldly person who gets all their satisfaction from what this can do, but what God can do through me. And it's excellent. I'm headed towards excellency. I'm not, I can't tell God, man, I'm, a, God, I'm a, a person of low estate. I wasn't in the right breeding. I wasn't in this. I wasn't in that. That has nothing to do with your potential. You are headed for excellencies. Isn't that something to look forward to? But you say, I'm failing. He knows. That's why he's given you all things. And he never changes because tomorrow you're going to need him more than you needed him today. I'm in a state of decline. All of your creation, God, is going downhill. Isn't that true? And you leave a person to themselves without any intervention, and that's exactly the direction they'll go. So this application, my life without God is headed in the wrong direction. But God is unchangeable, he's dependable, he has everything that I need because he has all the excellent characteristics, he has no sin, he doesn't change, and therefore every each and every day I can rely on him. So I can look at my children and think, you know what, I don't have to fret over them. I can pray. What if we get overtaken? By another country. What if North Korea invades? What if Russia invades? What is that? The, that's not the end of anything. God's not even concerned about that. It's you. He knows this world's going, he's going to roll this world up to, and there's a new heaven and a new, and it's coming. He's not trying to save this one, it's gone. But the God who never changes isn't gone. Do you see what I see? When you look at Jesus, do you see what God sees? That's what we're trying to convey tonight with our songs and our scripture reading down at the park. But I'm most important about us sitting in this room. The unchangeable nature, the conditions are always right for Christ to come bursting through in your life. <clears throat> My life is headed toward decline. I cannot sustain myself. I am very dependent and vigil. I need one who is dependable, constant, and never changes. Do you see what I see? All right, dependable teaching. Let's go back over to Hebrews chapter 13. Verses 7 and 9, the, the two verses that sam sam sandwich these, uh, not sandwich, <laughs> that's uh, the one duck show. All right. And these two verses, the subject appears. Let's look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you who have what? Spoken. 
All right, verse number nine. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. This is about teachings, all right? This is about things that I am taught, all right? So we're looking at dependable teachings. And what I really want to focus in here is the word and be not carried about, the phrase carried about. Carried about means to be led here and there, to be led to doubt and hesitation. You ever been that? Carried here and there, doubt and hesitation? All right. I'd like to give you an illustration of how that might be. Doubt and hesitation lead a person to go here and there. All right? Here is an illustration. Healthcare. I can talk about that because that's the one thing I know more than any other thing outside of the Bible, and I'm not saying I know much there. All right? Now, have you ever been told one thing say 20, 30 years ago, regarding your health, because you're concerned about that, only to have the doctor or another doctor turn around and tell you the exact opposite thing for that same health. Okay? It used to be when I started in the healthcare in heart, you, if you had heart disease, there was a couple things in the morning you did not eat. I'm telling you, you could gnaw on the cardboard that your cereal came in. You could eat a tile, but you were not going to eat this. What is one of the things you were not going to eat? Eggs. Oh, my stars. If you eat an egg, you might as well just get the putty, shove it up your artery, and call it good. You were not to eat eggs. Now, there's a, someone in this church that has had some heart issues and they went to their doctor and all of a sudden this person was told, can I eat, they asked the doctor, can I eat eggs? And they answered, yeah, well, you can eat all the eggs you want. Now, that is what the Bible calls carried about. Because you were told one thing at one particular time, and then you were told another thing, and that breeds confusion, all right? Now, you need to understand, some of the things that go on in the health field are just purely because of discovery. They keep studying, and they discover different things. But this is one thing I don't think very many people either know or have considered. Say, for example, a blood pressure pill. All right. Have you ever been put on a blood pressure pill and your friend put on the same blood pressure pill and yours works and gets your blood pressure right to exactly where it needs to be and that person takes it and it doesn't do anything to them or vice versa? All right. There is nothing in medicine that's 100%. Almost nothing, I should say. When they do studies, say, on blood pressure pills, they get as many people as they can with same characteristics, and they give them this pill, and they want to see, does this pill do anything to the people's blood pressure? And if it does affect enough of them, it is never 100%. It is always to the point of what they call statistical significance. And when it reaches statistical significance, then they feel that is enough to warrant them prescribing this medication. But it's never 100%. It is never 100% effective. That's why you take one pill, they give it to your husband in the same exact pill with the same exact condition, and he doesn't respond. But enough of them responded. And because it's not 100%, it causes you then to question every blood pressure pill. You shouldn't do that because they all have different characteristics. But it when it's not 100%, it causes doubt. Be then some of you just say, well, it cost six quadzillion dollars and I have a quadzillion dollar copay. I'm not paying for it. All right, and I don't blame you, but there's nothing that's 100%. And this is what causes this uncertainty in our hearts to be carried about these inconsistencies and this lack of being 100%. Oh, 
100% means all the time. That's what 100% means. Now, do I know of anything that is 100%? Jesus never changes. He is 100%. He's 100% the, the same. He never changes the uncertainty in my life then is not caused by Jesus. It is caused by me. When you think of the life of Jesus as portrayed in the Bible, does the word uncertainty pop into your mind? How about the word hesitant? How about the word for a loss? Does that, when you read that, does any of those words ever pop into your mind? Oh, if I was going to describe Jesus, I would describe him as hesitant. I would describe Jesus as very uncertain. I don't know why those guys followed him. Is that what you, when you read the Gospels, is, are those words that pop up in your mind? No, they're not words that hardly ever enter your mind. He comes across as he knows exactly what he's there for, exactly what he has to do, exactly where he's going, and exactly what he has to accomplish. He is 100% sure. It never appears as if the Pharisees, the Sadducees trick him and carry Jesus about. He always seems to be firm. What's all this fake news about? This fake news is to cause you to doubt and to hesitate. Right? And it comes across as absolute and then you find out it's we don't have fake news. We have good news. And that good news never changes. Because the God who proclaimed it never changes. And the results never change. It doesn't have one impact on you and a different impact on me and no impact on the other person. It has the exact same impact. And I still go back to when the young lady was in jail and we had three different Christians going to her and we didn't know the three of us were going to her separately. And she states to me this one day, do you know all three of you are telling me the same thing? How's that? How is that? Three different denominations. Two guys and a lady. And we're telling this young lady, we don't even know the other ones are involved yet. And she looks me in the face and said, do you know you guys are telling me the same thing? It's because of the God who never changes. It's the same message with the same power to do the same changing with the same results. There's no exceptions. It's not that God reached statistical significance so that he said, I better send my son down to the earth and die for their sins. Uh-uh. It is 100%. This is what needs to be done. This is what they need. They're in a state of decline. They cannot sustain themselves. I have to send the one who doesn't change. It can't be a variable message. It has to be the same clear message each and every time it's told. So that when an unbeliever such as this lady hears the Christian story, it was all the what? See, she was confused. I asked her, well, does, does that surprise you that we're all telling you the same message? And her answer was, yeah. See, because her Christianity, how it was explained to her, was not the Christianity that God would explain to you. It was man-made Christianity. Now that changes everywhere. The good news never changes. Why? Why does the good news never change? 
And I did not get to, <clears throat> to go through, obviously, all. I just chose John's gospel for the word truth because I saw in my reading that it came up a lot. And this isn't even a smattering of it. <clears throat> and the word was made flesh, and he dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and, and truth. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But the hour cometh, John, I think that's four or five, but the hour four, but, John, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such, such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is... You know what that does? That eliminates confusion. That eliminates from being carried away. I'm not teetering. It eliminates what James called the double-minded man. The double-minded man has two thoughts going through his head simultaneously. One is God's ordained truth. The other comes from him, the world, Satan, or somewhere else. It is not that, and he's battling with it. And God said, I'm going to take care of your dilemma when your mind's spinning. I'm going to eliminate half the problem. Everything that's not from me is not truth. Take care of it. That's very important. When a young person is trying to figure out what's real in this life. What's this all about? Man, I read one thing. I may go to a school. I don't know of too many schools that propagate this, but they could. They're certainly not all teaching creation. I'm looking at my friends getting hooked up on cocaine, crack, Heroin, dying, not caring, writing, fourth graders writing on their water cups, death, kill. Who was thinking of that when you were in fourth grade? Parents that run off to Timbuktu, live with, sleep with, whoever in the world, person of the day, person of the week, whatever flavor is going on, leave their third grader home four days without anybody knowing it, making them fend. I'm sure those kids are spent. What in the world's truth? What, where am I going here? To sit down <clears throat> and possibly listen to an unsaved counselor spin this garbage in front of them. Truth never changes. And the truth always sets you free. And I don't start with me to find truth. Why? Because I always, I'm in a state of what? Decline and change. That would be a wrong place to start for truth. So I'm going to show you a physical representation why you do not start with you for truth. You know what that is? It's famous. Do you know what that is? Just looking at that, do you know what that, tell me what it is. Don't say painting, I know that. Now, if we put that up there for hours, maybe some of you might come to something. Initially, when you see that, you, you think what? A mess. And that's exactly what it is. That's painted by a gentleman who decided to start with himself to determine truth. And as you can tell, nothing is clear. Because to him, with starting with self, trying to make sense of what he sees, nothing is clear. I haven't the foggiest idea what that is. 
And I used to think when the doctors took me to these art galleries, oh, don't take me to another one. You're going to sit there and go, oh, ah, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to look at them and say, what in the world are you looking at? And that's exactly what you're supposed to conclude. That communicates nothing because without the right truth, you can't communicate anything. It's just all messy. And that's what the world, that's exactly what the world looks like to the majority of the kids at Connections. That's exactly what it looks like. That's, that's what, that could be a picture of their home. That could be a picture of their parents. That could be a picture of what they think of school. That could be a picture of their neighborhood. That's what it looks like. When there's no truth and you decide, well, then truth is whatever you want it to be. And it's hard to see things when you don't know what truth is. Can you see that? Do you know what that is? What's the one on the left? Someone carrying a... What's the thing on the right? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Now, I may not know the particulars. I may have to have someone fill in the blanks I may have, but I don't have to guess what that is. That is extremely what? That's what truth does. It makes it so clear the answer for the world is they love darkness rather than, because that's too clear. That is too clear in the light. If we would shut off all the lights and we had blinds that would make this room totally dark and darken the back windows so that was dark, you, would, you couldn't tell the difference between this one and the previous one because it would be dark. And that's why the Bible says the people love darkness rather than light because that's really clear to me. And that's like going up to the kid at Connections and saying, would you stop that? And they don't want to take responsibility. They want to what? They want to point their finger. And it's anybody but me. And God says, no, it's you. And that's too hard for people to look at. Except when you've been covered by it then you realize just how important that is. And it's very, very clear. Reliable truth, reliable teaching. When, when you see things that clear, Somebody can come in here tooting their own horn, spewing forth their ungodly venom, and you'll recognize it because it's too clear. Paul, the admonition in Hebrews 13, verse 9 is, Be not carried about with strange what? Folks, when it's this clear... You aren't. And if I become disoriented, it wasn't me, it wasn't God, it wasn't Jesus. He never changes. Something happened to me. And of course, we'll like to blame God, but really, he can't change. So nothing happened with him. It happened with it happened with me. The stability of Jesus Christ. Do you see what I see? There's a progression. The night wind talked to the star, but eventually the king talks and says, there's something important in that manger. You are dependent 
and you need someone who's dependable. The condition God creates for his children is always perfect for Jesus Christ's likeness to come bursting through. He sets the perfect storm, if I could use that phrase, for Jesus Christ to come shining through in your life. Truth, unchangeable truth, is clear and evident. Self-centered truth is confusing and very unclear and causes more questions than answers. If you're here without Christ, do you see that? That's what it takes to get stability back in your life. That's what it takes to get truth back in your life. That's what it takes to stop your world from spinning out of control. That's what it takes to take you from despair to endless hope. This is the world. Isn't it no, is it no wonder it's in the condition that it's in? But that's not you. And praise God, we get to go forth and shine that light this evening and each and every evening, each and every day for Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Are you here this morning? Does your life currently look like this picture or the picture that was up there? Confusing one. That's not how Jesus is painting your life. Have you had trouble overcoming something? Now do you realize God never changes? The conditions are perfect for Christ to break through in your life, for you to shine forth Christ. Young person, are you confused? The world will do that to you. Christ will not. I'm not saying you're going to understand everything. I'm not saying I understand everything. But I'm telling you, I trust the truthful one. If God has spoken to your heart as the music begins to play, you do business with him.